Okay, well, let's get started. We've got a great group here to start with. Um, it's just such a, such a joy to have you on this call with us, Karch. Thank you again for joining us. I'd also like to welcome all our viewers from Forza One Volleyball Club. I know they all appreciate having you as the leader uh, of our volleyball community in the United States and for being on this call with us. You know, all of well, our thank listeners- thank you. Yeah. Super lucky. And w next time we'll have to do it in person. We usually make this about an annual thing. Get out to your club, play, play out at Murrieta Mesa, and you guys crush it with the crowd out there. Oh, well, thank you. I know our players just are such huge fans and supporters, and it's exciting even for me as a club director to see how many kids go out and support and just really get into the spirit of it. So we'll be happy to host whenever you guys are ready. Fantastic. So, We're already um, ready, but it's going to be a long way away. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know, as our listeners already know, uh, you're the women's volleyball national and Olympic team coach since 2012. You were also the first person, male or female, uh, to win Olympic gold in both indoor and beach volleyball. Uh, you were selected as the uh, greatest volleyball player of the century by the FIVB. And in addition to that giant impact on the volleyball world, you were also named the Beach AVP Most Valuable Player six times. So for all of our listeners out there, let's just let that sink in for a minute. You know, Karch, I know this is kind of a big welcome, um, but certainly nothing new for you. And, you know, I really feel and believe that there's a part of you, or if not all of you, that recognizes your intrinsic strengths and values that make you who you are and have really led you on your path to success. And so I want to invite you today to share what you've learned with our players so that they can learn everything possible from your story, your path as an athlete, and, and who you are as a person. So, you know, let's start with a question. Uh, I've been in your gym, and, you know, character seems to really be a hallmark of the USA team and something that your players clearly value. So tell us what character means to you and, and why it's so important in sports and volleyball. Well, we think that um, one of our goals, everybody who's played volleyball for a while um, and played on a variety of teams, at least two or three, everybody's been on a team that is more fun to be a part of and other teams that are less fun to be a part of. And some have, and, and you've all probably been on teams that add up, um, to less than the sum of their parts. You know, it seems like you might have some pretty good parts, but just that chemistry factor, the trust factor between people seems to suffer and it adds up to less than it should on paper. And then you've probably been on teams that add up to about the sum of their parts than the sum of our parts. And with USA, we've got a lot of amazing parts already, but the world has a lot of great teams. Uh, we've been this, the USA women's national team, women's Olympic team. Um, and with the announcement for sure that the Olympics, that was just yesterday, that the Olympics will take place almost exactly a year later, next year in 20. Since the Olympics started indoor volleyball back in Tokyo in 1964. And we have not reached that. We've won the silver three times. We've won the bronze two times. So stood on the podium a lot, but not on that top step. And so how are we going to do that? We think we're going to have to out-team the other teams in that competition to add up to more than the sum of our parts. And we think that it's our belief that the way we can do that is to have this huge amount of trust between each teammate and between all the members of our program, players and coaches alike. And how do you develop that trust? Um, it's our belief that better people make better volleyball players and people of higher character and integrity are going to help us maximize that trust factor that we know we're gonna need. Nobody wins a, a big tournament like a qualifier or a junior nationals or a high school sectional or state championship or an NCAA championship or an Olympic gold medal without facing down massive adversity at least once, if not twice during a tournament or during a lead up to a tournament like that. 
And so that's when that trust and that character really comes into play is when you fall down 2-0 in a really critical match or it's your plan and it's in the fifth set of a best of five match and we're down 12 to eight and it doesn't seem like the odds are very much in our favor, but that's when that character and that trust is going to come into play, has to kick into play because nobody wins major championships like that. The things that you all aspire to do, the things we aspire to do without having that character and that trust to fall back on. Yeah, you know, I remember so many important matches in my life where I had to overcome those challenges and it really was a personal skill to be able to keep myself in the right state of mind or in the, in the right moment to be able to execute under that amount of pressure. And then I also remember failing in big matches and having some moments of realization that I could no longer continue doing certain things if I didn't want to repeat the same failures. I had to really change my character for the better. I had to either maybe be a little bit better teammate or I had to make better decisions. Um, maybe I had to get back to the gym and, and have better practice habits. <clears throat> I'm sure as, a, as an amazing athlete and tough competitor, you went through probably some difficult moments or matches where you elevated your character. Do you have any specific memories or moments that really stand out for you that are great lessons for our players? Well, for sure. And one of the, um, you know, we're all in a different time right now. It's a challenging time, not only for our country, but for countries around the world with this public health challenge that we face. And it, uh, on the one hand, it helps us understand that volleyball is just a game. We're lucky that there's not life and death on the line. But on the other, it's some great practice. The, and the practice that we're going through now is a lot like a, a volleyball contest. The whole thing about a match or a competition is we've got a lot of anxiety going in we, we don't know what's going to happen. That's the tough thing about competition. If you're playing against a well-matched team, you don't know the outcome. There's some anxiety that comes along with that. You bring the best you have, but you don't know what's going to happen. And so, yeah, um, what would be an example of where um, my teammates and I really struggled and fell short. It was early. I played on the USA men's team for eight or nine years uh, in the ancient times back in the 1980s. But uh, during that time, uh, early on, we played in a big tournament called the World Championships. Internationally, there are three big tournaments every four years, World Championships, World Cup, and then the Olympics got to compete in. Um, we had a tough group right out of the gate because we were such a low ranked team. And so in our very first match of the tournament, we knew it was a critical one. We, we also had in our group, the number one team in the world, the Soviet Union, we call them Russia now, but at that time they were called the Soviet Union. And so we knew they were very likely to win our group. It's a group of four, and we needed to finish first or second to move into the top half of the tournament. And if we finished third or fourth, we, could, we would immediately not be able to finish any better in that tournament than 13th. So coming out of the gate against a strong team from Bulgaria, we knew that um, you know we didn't get to ease our way into that tournament at all. It was gnarly right from the start, and um, and that's because we assumed the Soviet Union would win all three of those pool play matches. So we played and battled Bulgaria and had a, a great match, and we were. Uh, this is in again ancient times when we didn't play rally scoring, but we played side out scoring, which means you could only win a point when your team was actually serving. And so the games would last a lot longer, but uh, we got to a 12-4 lead in the fifth set and figured out a way to lose. We just had an ultimate meltdown 
Um, most of it was because we were at that point, 12 to four, I think we were also up 14 to 11 um, and ended up losing, I think 17, 15. We were playing not to lose instead of playing to win. For much of the match, we were playing and letting it rip. And then we got conservative. And we also, uh, so the, the huge lesson there was to, um, there are two ways to play. And one is avoiding failure. And the other is approaching success and letting it rip. And so that was our huge lesson that avoid playing to avoid failure and pe playing to avoid losing was not bringing out the best in us. And another huge lesson uh, that it gave us is here we are, we finished, ended up just from, we lost to the Soviets. We actually played them closer than any team played them in that tournament. All three sets that we lost were deuce games. They just crushed everybody in the tournament, but barely beat us. And still we could do no better than 13th. So um, it also gave us a new sense of urgency because we only had two years to go until the Olympic Games would be in Los Angeles in 1984. We got to host. That's coming up again in eight years, in 2028, back in the Los Angeles area. Um, but it gave us a sense of urgency, like, whoa, we've got to step it up even more in our training gym. We've got to use every minute available because we've got less than two years now before this massive tournament called the Olympics. And finally, the Bulgarians ran some weird combination plays and we didn't really have answers and didn't really adjust at all during that match. Figure out, we didn't have uh, some other tools to put blockers in different places and take away some of their favorite shots. And so we added, it also forced us to expand our uh, thinking and our actual ability to do what's possible. And so we invented some new blocking schemes and um, and so we couldn't wait. About seven, eight months later, we hosted Bulgaria after um, they had kind of dashed our hopes at the World Championships. Couldn't wait to host them in the USA. We had them here for a series of four or five friendly matches, and we just took it out on them. We used our new blocking strategy on the first play of the game and just stuffed them. And we just made them pay. We didn't lose for the rest of my career. We never lost to them. We beat them 30 straight times. And, but in a sense, we should have been thanking them because I think without that loss, uh, I don't know that we would have gone on to win an Olympic Games, to win a World Cup, to win the next World Championships, and to win another Olympic Games. But that was a huge gift. That failure... I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about yeah, it. I don't know if I'm sure, but, um, but that failure, that falling short and those lessons were massive for us. And so um, um, we were uh, ultimately really thankful to have things like that happen. Yeah, what a, what a great story. I can feel those goosebumps too, you know, like, and that's exactly what I was kind of referring to is, is that as, as athletes, we have such big moments that truly impact like the rest of our life, the rest of our training. They completely shift how we think. And, you know, it's such a great correlation to what's happening right now because we're all facing a really difficult challenge. And, you know, with players that don't feel like they can practice or improve, in some ways that's going to feel like a failure of, of uh, production. And to me, you know, this challenge, this failure can really be the birth of invention. And I think that refers perfectly to what Karch just talked about. You know, they invented a new blocking scheme. They invented a new way to think about how to beat this team and how to prepare for a gold medal. And there's been no probably better time in history for kids to learn to invent themselves as a volleyball player, to invent their own training, to invent some kind of game, to um, take their their understanding of the game to the next level. So let's all really listen to that story and use it for inspiration at, with our at-home training. 
Um, you next, know, you, you, sorry to interrupt, but you mentioned please. at home training. There's um, some great studies that have been done. For example, when they take people who haven't played a lot of basketball or maybe intermediate, no more. They're not like they're expert basketball players, but when they've done studies about how to improve their performance, for example, with free throws, they divide these equally capable groups into three parts. And one actually um, practices free throws. And then another um, just in their mind practices. So they sit at home without actually doing. They watch some on video and then they practice it in their mind. And then the third group does nothing. And the first two groups actually improved about the same. The group that actually shot free throws and then the group that only imagined or visualized shooting free throws because things are firing in their brain that would be firing just as if they were actually moving and doing it or had a ball in their hand and they were sending it toward the rim. So there's a lot that you can do in terms of watching people who are really good at what they do right now and visualizing um, how they do it, what they do, asking yourself a basic question, which might be, what is she doing and what can I learn from that? How can I use that to make me a little better, even if I don't have a team around me or even a ball and a net to work with, but there are things that you can do that uh, right now that are proven as uh, they've done lots of studies on that to actually help you improve yourself to the, um, and so hopefully you guys can still make progress. That's the same thing we're trying to do with the USA team right now, because we don't get to practice with a ball either. And we're trying to get ready for big competitions coming up and eventually the Olympics next year. And so we have to foster that same kind of development and just get really creative in this chaotic time. Yeah, it's so awesome that you brought that up because we've um, been talking to our athletes about what we are referring to as mirror neuron learning and being able to fire and wire in your brain <clears throat> the actions and the memories um, associated with actual physical performance. And you're right, there is a ton of science and research demonstrating the validity of that. And I think any athlete can just experience that on their own too. You know, like I remember watching the Karate Kid and afterward feeling like somehow I could move myself like a little bit like karate, even though I had never done it. And so I kind of have a personal experience of that. And the science really helps us do that. And I think engaging it more emotionally act, actually activates that learning process even more. So if you're really invested in the visualizations emotionally and you actually really exaggerate the level of imagination that you apply to mm -hmm. the visualizations, it actually engages the networks and the neurons in your brain at a higher level and it becomes even more real. And those memories start to move into, you know, your electrical system and you change. So I think, you know, Karch, we could all come out better um, from this experience if we really apply ourselves to these inventions, so to speak, of, uh, of training. So um, let's go uh, to the next topic. Um, again, I, I really feel like, you know, you're a, you're a champion, Karch, in every way. And there must be some qualities about you that specifically have led you to become that. So maybe it's dedication or maybe, you know, you have the ability to really focus. Maybe what are one or two things about your character specifically that have led you to be where you are today? Well, from a competitive standpoint, um, I think we all fall into two basic groups. Uh, when we're actually keeping score on the scoreboard. And one group is people who love to win and the other is people who hate to lose. And maybe I'm a little more of the latter. Uh, and I will just try to dig deep and figure out any way to win the next point. So I think one of the things that um, my teammates and I got really good at was um, dividing this thing called a volleyball competition or a match into these little parts because it's intimidating 
if you're thinking about a best three out of five match, um, often against between well-matched teams, that's over 200 plays, could be over 230 plays. Um, you know, some of the hardest fought matches we've had or maybe where we score 110 points, they score 110 points and it's dead even, but somebody has to come out by ahead by at least two in that last, that fifth set. Um, but I've always found it easier to try to divide it into the discrete parts. And so it's much more like it's going to be 200 competitions. And then forget about those other 199. And the first one out of the gate is the only one that counts. And it's zero, zero. And that first point that we earn or don't earn is just as important uh, now as it is when it's 24 all. If we can get a little more advantage now, jump out of the gate faster, be ready and fully prepared to do everything we can to win that one point. It doesn't mean we will. But if we can stay more engaged in this one point, then flush it and get ready for that, the next point, the second point, and stay engaged as much as possible in that one, we're going to swing their, uh, the odds a little our way. And all we really need to do is win about 51% of the points instead of 50. So if we play 200 points, let's get, instead of 100 of them, let's get 102 of them. Let's get 103 of them. That's all we need against a great team on the other side of the net. Um, and so if we can stay engaged as much as possible in this next single play and completely forget, no matter how well the last play went or how crappy the last play went, if we can forget that and get back to being good, um, that's one of the great ways to swing the odds and the pendulum just a tiny bit our way. That's all we need is uh, these slight advantages of being more engaged on what's going on and playing this one point. So that was something that I got my teammates and I got to be quite good at was um, having this single point focus. Play this one play and, and then um, immediately maybe take one quick lesson from it or just drop it if it went horrendously and pick ourselves right back up, forget that play and know that there are 200 of them and some of them aren't going to go very well. But if we can get right back to being fully prepared for the next one, we will get an advantage just in that alone. So that's one thing I think that really helped us in terms of competing is um, taking these discrete parts they're much it's much less overwhelming if I can just take one this one and that's all that counts and then another one and that's all that counts and then just be prepared to to repeat that um, however long it takes until the last whistle blows will it come out come out our way no it won't always but for us to have a chance, the best chance possible to make it come out our way, knowing that we don't have full control and the enemy always has a say, the best chance we have is to do exactly that and just repeat that on a, a point by point basis. And then the other thing is just to, and this is where the time we have now where we're deprived of being in the gym together, it's gonna help us even more once we get back, uh, get get to work our way back into the gym is we're going to cherish that and be so grateful for those moments that first day back. And we need to remember that. But um, I tried to um, just go all out in everything I did. So I wanted to be the best shagger. I, we, we would have contests who could carry the most volleyballs without we'd put a whole bunch of volleyballs down on the floor. Didn't get to have any assistance, nobody picking up the ball and putting it on you when you already have eight or nine on there, but who could pick up the most and carry them 25 or 30 feet and put them into the bucket without dropping any. So tried to be the best shagger when I was out of the activity, also because it helps the, the drill or whatever you're doing go better and it keeps people safe when you keep volleyballs off the floor so nobody's gonna land on it. And just 
throw myself at full intensity at everything that we're doing. And that too is along the lines of full intensity for the next point. Yeah, I guess so many, so many great insights in what you just shared. Um, you know, what you're talking about with single point focus, I think is uh, what people are talking about right now with being in the present moment and being able to play, you know, one point at a time with full attention. And, you know, I remember as a player, you know, being at the net, especially for blocking, because that was always a challenge for me, being a smaller blocker at the higher level, is it was like I had to bring like my full attention into the moment. I needed to make sure I knew where the hitters were and what route they were going to run and that my fingers were alive and active. And, you know, I wasn't going to be even a half of a second behind. And so teaching athletes to like pull their attention up and engage um, is so is so important to what we're doing. And it's, I think, what allows us to compete at a high level. The other piece um, that you talked about was being strategic. And I think, you know, pointing out the volume of points is so important. You know, sometimes we get so stuck on one or two or three points when there's gonna be, you know, 75 or in your case, 200 played throughout a match. So if we can manage our mindset and be willing to throw some out, but also have a very clear picture of how many we need to win and, and the quality of play we need to put together point after point um, with some forgiveness, that allows us to, to have more space to be able to, um, to maybe lose focus and then bring it back and be a little bit more flexible. And that's another thing that we've been trying to teach our youth because you know we're in kind of a stressful society at the moment. I think that's changing right now, but, um, helping kids to access uh, those emotional tools to be able to get stressed and relax, recover and refocus are so important. So um, thanks for sharing your process with that as an athlete and as a coach. You know, I know even as a coach, I try to apply the things that you're talking about because it's really easy to you know, stop coaching or get distracted or have a, ch a chat with somebody on my bench because we're up five points. And now I just have decided that I stand up, I keep my eyes forward, and I even tell myself like, stay focused, just stay focused so that I don't miss opportunity. And you know, when you're saying that the majority of the matches that you won and lost are won and lost by deuces or by two points, that's, that's the demand that is on all of us uh, in terms of our attention and the quality of our attention. So I'm sure that you see that in your gym and um, with your players. How do you feel like they succeed with this? What are they working through um, at the international level? Well, you're right uh, in terms of the closeness of competition. And um, so you can even approach that. If you're playing a really quality opponent across the net, uh, a well-matched opponent, um, some people could look at that and say, oh boy, they're, um, I'm a little down. They're going to be tough to beat. Uh, but the other, but the other way to frame it is, wow, what a gift to be challenged. We don't know what the outcome is going to be, but these are the kinds of opponents and competitions that are going to make us better. We don't get better when we're beating somebody 25 to 12. Um, we could guarantee the outcome and play um, teams five years younger than us, but that wouldn't be any fun at all. There's no fun in that, uh, in that certain outcome. The fun is in the uncertain outcome. And yeah, it hurts when it doesn't go our way, but those, that's how we get better is when we get pushed and we embrace that. So we think of, uh, try to think of that as a gift. And we're really lucky because in, our USA gym, we have many of the best players, a lot of the best players in the world, and certainly almost all of the best players in the country. So every time we set up an activity, set up a, a game or a competition in a USA practice, it's gnarly and it's close and it's hard fought. And so we get a lot of practice because of how even it is on either side, no matter 
how we form the teams and who's on what team, um, you're, both sides have to work really hard to earn that point. So we try to set up a lot of challenging but even competitions in training because we know those are the kinds of things that we're going to have to embrace and face the adversity of, embrace the adversity of, in order to beat a great team across the net. Some of the great teams around the world are teams like Serbia and Italy and China and Brazil and Turkey and Russia and, and others. And so they're all going to be great teams at the Olympics. There are a lot of teams that are going to be there that are going to be hungry for the same thing, uh, trying to win a gold medal. Uh, now a year from July, starting on July 23rd of next year. But the more we can practice that in our own gym and get challenged by it, um, practice our reset. A lot of you, I'm sure, have been a part of a match where either your team scored three or four or five in a row, and that ended up being the difference, or maybe your team had uh, a little breakdown in being in attention, in focus, in being engaged, and gave up one run of four or five points. And that turned out to be the difference in allowing the other team to have more points at the end of that set. And so um, one of the great ways to practice that is just to make sure that when the other team scores one or two or three in a row that we're doing our very best to reset and throw away in our mind the results of those last few plays and do everything possible to get ready to win the next point and and being we call it the mostly we call it being engaged having a really high level of engagement you mentioned the the word attention there's also the word focus they all mean basically the same thing and that is what is the very next thing I have to do? If I'm a passer, the very next thing I have to do is see the serve coming at me and put it somewhere where our, our setter can then do her job. And then that setter needs to put a ball up that doesn't need to be perfect, but just needs to be in a pretty good spot and let the hitter do her job. And now we're all back to doing our jobs. And then if the play continues, we all get ready to block and defend. Yeah, it's, it's so much fun, you know, when the whole team is engaging on that level, um, there's a different quality to it. That's, you know, the zone that so many of us athletes talk about and coaches talk about. And when it becomes collective, uh, it just really, really gets fun. And, and that's really what elevates the competition. And that's, that's the reason why we want to play good competition so that we're pushed into that realm of experience on the volleyball court. And when you're engaged like that, you know, um, this happens with lots of teams. If they give up three points in a row, uh, it's, it's hard for any team, no matter how good, not to get a little smaller, their body language. We tend to yeah. uh, look down at the floor more, not look each other right in the eyes as much. Um, we tend not to gather in our huddle as tightly. And that's one thing people love to do is to gather in their huddle between plays. And so if part of being engaged is that we look the same, no matter whether we won the last point or lost the last point. And even, and sometimes good teams are going to win three points in a row against us. But can we keep looking the same and can we keep resetting and keep doing the same things? That's going to be the most important thing in terms of stopping that run and keeping that opponent from scoring a fourth or a fifth point in a row is the fact that we don't get small and we don't stop looking each other in the eye and we don't stop touching each other with fives and uh, other um, physical contact and, and we just stay completely engaged in uh, doing our jobs on the next play. Yeah, I, I love how that's true at every level of volleyball and, you know, probably just in every level of life. And it's so much fun when the, when the kids really start to get that and, and, and they yeah. do it with a sense of empowerment. It, it really changes the game. And that's where I think they start to achieve what you were talking about earlier, which is 
getting two extra points and that's the difference maker or being just a little bit better than Bulgaria, right? It's, it's those fine yeah. details that are the difference maker. So let's talk a little bit more about competition. I, I love what you said a minute ago about how you were all in in all that you do. And at Forza One, we've kind of redefined competition as striving for excellence in everything that you do, really taking the focus away from the opponent and putting the focus on the self and um, the actions and the thoughts that we're having and really doing that in all that we do because that's what high level achievers are doing. They're achieving a high level in, in a lot of different categories. So, you know, for you, as I think collectively, we elevate um, competition into things that resemble things more like cooperation and collaboration. I'm curious, what are the things in your gym specifically that you do with 40 amazing players who could all be easily on the top six starting lineup? How do you foster competition uh, for the individual and at the same time uh, to focus on cooperation and collaboration between those competitors? Um, that's a good question. I think one of the things that we have to clarify, especially at our level, is uh, players have to ask themselves questions like, what's more important? Um, that I'm a starter on this team or that we win a gold medal, like uh, as we set a big goal out there, or what's more important, a tougher question, that I'm on the roster of 12 at the Olympics and I make the team, or that our program earns the right to stand at the top of the podium and win a gold medal. Those are not easy questions to answer, but if ultimately people are making it more about the team and the program and we're all, we have 40 people who are doing their best to help this program do things it's never done before, even if it means that only 12 of those 40 or so can actually go and represent us, we'd love to take 40 to the Olympics, but we only get to take 12 and have them actually have a uniform on. We wish we could afford to take the other, um, at what, 28 people and have them in the stands because they make us, they all count. Every single person makes us better or can make us better. They, um, they make an impact, they make a difference. And even though we get to take only 12 to the Olympics and 14 to most other competitions, far more than 14 actually have an impact on who we are. And so that's where it boils down to finding ways to make people around you better every day. Great volleyball players elevate the play of those around them, elevate the people around them, make them better. And, um, and the other great thing about um, competition is uh, because we have a lot of people who are, as I'm sure you do in all of your Forza programs, but you've got good friends on your side of the net and good friends on the other side of the net. So how do we honor our friends best across the net? It's not by being easy on them because they're our friend. It's actually because I'm trying just as hard against my best friend across the net when she's on the other side as I am when she's on my side um, and honoring her as a friend and as a volleyball player by trying our hardest, uh, by trying my hardest and challenging her and um, making her work and her teammates work their hardest to try to score that point against us. But when we have really um, even, tough, fierce competitions like that, in training, then we're more ready for the even tough, fierce competitions that we play when we get to play tournaments. Yeah, I, um, I often talk to our players about how, you know, regardless of how many points you play, you're contributing to the outcome of the game. And I can mm -hmm. only imagine how true that is at your level with the quality of players that come through the national team program. 
you know, when, when you're standing on the podium at the next Olympics on the highest level, you know, you're going to have this perspective looking back of even maybe one player that was in the gym for a week that just had some little impact in getting them there. And so we're really trying to train the, the individuals in our gym to understand that what they develop is equal to their contribution. And they're really the only person that can evaluate the quality of their contribution. And, you know, they, they can judge it in terms of a positive that they were able to contribute one week in the gym with the USA national team. They were able to, um, you know, block a ball in this situation and make that hitter who just helped win a medal, uh, you know, get a little bit better. And so that's so important at the youth level because there are big divisions sometimes within teams and not everybody contributes equally. And I, I just wanted to share that with, with players today that this is happening at every level. And as Karch said, use it as an advantage, use it to motivate you and to make you better. And then also remember that, the, you know, the, the team's goal and the team achieving its highest potential is really what it's all about. And however big or small your part is in that is, is really the value of your contribution. And, and then it's your job to value that and to appreciate it and celebrate it. And, you know, since, go ahead, Karch. Oh, I was going to say, um, yeah, an example of that would be we, we can only have two outside hitters on the court. And then we have two outside hitters who are waiting to help if their competitive opportunity, their instant of competition comes along. But we sure want to be the kind of team where the players who are not on the court are cheering their fellow teammates, all teammates, but especially those in their position on, um, being a pair of eyes for them when they're off the court because they have a perspective that the players on the court cannot have, standing a little more behind the court. They can be almost like a player coach and give them tips like, hey, they're giving you a lot of line or they're, uh, if you're a hitter, they're, they're getting ready for all of your hard-driven shots. Nobody looks like they're ready for a tip and are, are an off-speed or uh, all the other details. And so staying engaged like that and sharing information like that makes it more of a collaboration. Helps, that's a way to elevate the play of those around you and also stay ready if you get called upon to get in. And so we definitely um, cherish that and encourage that, especially in our position groups, that they're working together to be the best. There's two setters on our team at that tournament usually. And they're both working to make the setter who's on the court the best she can be for our team. Yeah, that's, that's such a specific action and behavior that you just described for our players to mirror um, as being competitive and doing all that you can do in all the things that you do, right? So whether you're on the court being the setter, or whether you're the off the court being the setter, coach player setter, it doesn't really matter. Being a competitor is doing all that you can do in all that you can do. And I just, I love that. And I, I really, I really see that in your players. I really appreciate their mentality on the bench, what the huddles look like, what the timeouts look like. And you can just tell that they all feel valued and they all feel like they're contributing. And that's really what we want for our youth players in our club is to understand how to engage, how to um, behave so that they they enrich the team and, and get rewarded themselves as well. So, um, all right, we're coming to the end of our call here. I just have one more question. And that is that, you know, Karch, a lot of coaches talk about non-negotiables um, and, you know, that they have non-negotiables because those are sim simply things that don't move the team in the right direction or maybe are even disruptive. And so I'm curious if you have any non-negotiables. You obviously have a ton of experience and I'm sure there's things you know that just don't work in a team environment. So what are those, um, if you have any? Um, we don't, people, some people might be surprised to hear, we don't have many team rules with our USA team. Um, a couple, uh, the, the simple ones are um, bring honor to our program 
And so if there's something you do, a player does or says that does not do that, does the opposite of that, then obviously that's something that we want to happen as little as possible. And then also, um, uh, we need effort. We need people going after the ball. Um, if, if a soft play or an off speed, uh, play comes at us, if nobody's hitting the floor, when the ball's hitting the floor, that's not something that we're happy about either. And so bringing honor to the program and bringing effort, no matter the result of the play, but bringing maximum effort. Um, and, uh, because you, that second one, the effort component, otherwise we're, we're wasting some of our time in training and we have to make every minute count as much as possible. There are other great teams, lots of other great teams. Once we all get back to training, there are lots of other great teams out there also training. And so we have to use our time better than they use their time uh, and improve faster. And the way we're gonna improve fastest is to develop these habits of maximum effort and always going after the ball. We also know that if I don't go, I'll never know if I could have gotten it. And we don't wanna have that kind of doubt. So um, we never want to have a, a habit of letting a ball drop without somebody or multiple people hitting the floor and going after it. Um, you've all played, we have played too, even at the international uh, level, you've played these pesky teams that just won't go away. Maybe they're shorter than you. Maybe they don't hit the ball as hard, but dang, it's hard to win a rally against them because they just never give up. And when you're not playing them, they're pretty fun to watch these pesky teams yeah. because they're just running all over the gym and keeping ball, uh, keeping plays alive that you necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily have thought that they would have. And then when they are across the net, they're tougher to play. We want to be that kind of pesky team too. And that's all about effort and effort is something we always get to control. Yeah. And what a, what a great message right now um, when the players are at home training and have a bunch of free time and get to decide what to do with their energy and, and what to do with their, <clears throat> their availableness. And, you know, we're encouraging them to access our online resources and other resources to put effort into their continuing development as an athlete and as a person. And, I think honor is a big piece of that too. You know, you honor yourself when you fuel your passions. You honor yourself when you get out there and move yourself in the direction of your goals. You know, there's so many different things we could be doing right now. And, you know, having you on this call today, I think gives our kids so much, in, so much insight and so much fuel to be greater and to become a giant in their own lives. And that, that they, can really, they can really direct that uh, on their own from home and utilize those mirror neuron uh, learning concepts and watching great players and listening to uh, calls like this to really transform themselves into a, a better version of themselves. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. And, um, you know, I want to just reiterate what you said, and that is to be fun in uncertain times and also to be inventive. Uh, in uncertain times. So let's all do that together. And, and who knows what volleyball will look like uh, when we all come back to the gym. Mm -hmm.